Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another lecture in our series, Digital and Analog. Tonight, we have a guest from Switzerland, Anet Spiro. I do a short introduction. Um, Anet Spiro um, is, comes from Zurich. She has studied goldsmithing and jewelry design at the Academy of Applied Art in Zurich. And then after that education, she changed her mind or developed her mind <laughs> in another scale. And she studied architecture at the ETH Zurich, where she did her diploma at uh, um, the um, with Flora Rüscher. I don't know. I know her. Maybe you don't know her. She's not so famous outside of Switzerland, maybe. Um, she has been teaching at several schools. She has te been teaching in Lucerne, in Basel, and then was named um, professor for construction at the ATR Zurich in 2007. There she teaches first year students together with um, another professor who teaches design. So she, there it's split in two topics, construction and design. Um, Anne Spiro is also a practicing architect she founded her office together with her husband, Stefan Gantenbein, in 91 in Zurich and has been member of many juries and committees uh, since then. She has been working in Brazil, where she studied the work of Paulo Mendes da Roca, and she published a very nice book about uh, this architect that has the same age than you have. <laughs> she, yeah, no, when did, ah, oh, excuse me, no, that was before, yeah, wrong. Um, then besides that, there came another book about plaster surfaces that was uh, the work of a research at uh, the ETH, together with her team. And now she's preparing another book about construction plans, something that is a special interest of her already a long time, and uh, that the ATR has started uh, with her a collection of construction plans. So please welcome Anne Spiro. Dear students, I have to admit my, my, uh, my speech today, this evening, is made for students who are on the, on the beginning on, a, on an architectural career. Uh, dear colleagues and dear guests, uh, I would like to make a yeah, thank uh, Jürgen for his nice intro and for inviting me. I have to admit it's my first time in Norway and of course my first time in Trondheim. And so I would like what everybody does maybe, oh no, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Can one put a bit out this blue light? It disturbs the, the yeah, perfect. I would like to start with a small intro how I came here and I did what everybody does. First, if you go on a new place, you go on Google Earth and look where you are going to. So that was my first view of your city. And it has a lot to do <coughs> with my team this night because I think the plans begin with the maps. And I have to say also that 
you have everything, I have not. And I am very uh, envying you because you have the sea, something what I like most. You have the ships. My first wish was not to be an architect, but to be a captain of such a boat. <laughs> and then you have very nice maps, which we don't have at Switzerland because we have no sea. It's a, a sea map, and it's already opening my seam uh, about construction drawings. I don't. I am not, never sure if you say it's construction drawing or construction plan. Plan is only a floor plan. So if I say plan or, or drawing, it, for me it's the same. Construction drawings are love letters. That was my title. And I took this phrase out of an essay of the, um, by the American architect and theorist Stein Lewis. And I would like to, to quote the whole phrase. I always understood construction drawings as love letters to the past. Innovations <clears throat> and responses over time and space. From one author to the other. This was obviously also the opinion of T.S. Eliot, who said that every time when he sat down to write, Homer, the Greek uh, philosopher, answered. What I like in this sentence is the idea that the construction drawing is an instrument to overcome time and space, to enter in a dialogue between authors and to exchange over time and space. And even more, our writing draw, or drawing, in our case, is not only an answer to another author. <coughs> sorry, the author of the past is also answering us. It's about embedding uh, the embedding of any work and thought in the big archive of all the works in architecture, then at any time and in any place. Construction drawings are love letters. I think love is essential to make architecture, but one should not talk it to death. So remains the letter. And <clears throat> it's obvious, construction drawings are messages. It is an instrument of communication. It addresses someone. And so the topic of my lecture will be real the working drawing. I don't refer to project sketches, nor to publication drawings, I really refer only and exclusively to the drawing that goes to the <coughs> building site, that you will take to the building site. The instrument has a big impact on the result. <coughs> the tool affects the working process and therefore the final object too. Whether you draft your plans with a pencil or with a parametrical computer program, by all means, the design instrument has an effect on the final result. The construction drawing <clears throat> is the final culmination of the lasting and intense process of design. When we finally come to the construction drawing, every preceding plan has gone out of use. You could really throw away every sketch, every drawing, everything you have done until then. But I know you won't do it. No architect will do that, but he could if he want. Because the preceding drawings have no real need anymore, except the historical interest in the, progress, uh, the process of design. All the effort, all the countless hours, all the pains and joys and what you have when you are drawing or uh, uh, projecting, work, all this goes to the final drawing. The thousands line of movements of a pencil or a mouse, it's the, the, the last drawing when you finish is the, the construction drawing and it stands exactly uh, between the edge of, or on the edge between the design process and the built work. So all drawings I'll show you are drawn by the architects themselves. What you see here is, uh, is Ponti drawing on his building site in Milano. That's what I mean when I see, uh, say the construction drawing. 
because I think you can communicate ideas or you can even de delegate very important uh, business meetings, but you will only come to the final concept and the shape through drawing and modeling. I remember when I made the very first uh, uh, excursion with uh, seminar week in Zurich when I was the first year uh, at ETH. We went to Köln, Köln to the Ruhrgebiet, and we had the great privilege and pleasure to visit the, the studio of Gottfried Böhm, you know, Gottfried Böhm who made this big uh, concrete churches. And he's over 19 years old. The one you said <laughs> is also <laughs> more than 80. He's more than 90 years old and he has a, a studio full of models, hundreds and hundreds of models. And the students uh, were asked to, to do questions and at the last the very last question of a very shy student thought, Mr. Bohm, why do you make so many models? And then he was a bit quiet, he, he thought a while, and then he answered, I think with my hands. And I think that's a bit the point also with drawing, you think with, when you're drawing. So I would like to encourage you as future architect to draw even construction drawings by yourself. Even if you become very busy, even if you became a very famous architect, don't give the, thro the drawing away. There are many reasons to take a look at a working drawing. The most important reason for me is it's your instrument. It's the genuine instrument of the architect. So we have a quite in, uh, very short intro with mapping because I think that the beginning of the idea to, to draw the thing you see, to, to, to transform the reality into a plan or a, a 2D paper sheet is with mapping. The astronaut, astronaut who would navigate with this map would got lost forever in space. This map does not serve practical orientation, but rather has another purpose. Images from the worlds of gods and myths are projected upon the constellation of stars in the heavens. This map shows the human desire to place the heavens into an ordering system. Here, no images are being conveyed. Instead, an unknown waste landscape is provided with names. Names, too, create order and make the incomprehensible comprehensible. What you see here is not just, or it's not a Photoshop trick, but rather a detail from a work beyond any scientific doubt. Both map maps are from the Times Atlas. On the left, you see the detail from the edition of 1986. On the right, the same detail from the edition of 2005. I have both editions at home, and I can assure you it's not a deception. What has happened here? The Swain Island did not submerge. Rather, it simply never existed. It was created from the fantasy of a tired sailor, and it was mapped, it was named, and lasted at such for uh, centuries. What I would like to say with this bizarre example is that through time maps have not only served orientation in a newly discovered land, I think they have also always served the imagination as well. I think maps fire the imagination. And this is exactly what I would like to show with the construction drawing. Or another last uh, map. The object of these two maps is the same. The scale is as well the same, but the hatching on the left side tells a totally different uh, dramatic story about the counter lines than this prosaic uh, precision, of the, uh, precision of the right picture. So ma maps are more than simply 
graphic survey, they interpret, they comment, and they appraise the world. <clears throat> so even the very neutral survey plan is far away of being an objective thing. So I would like to begin with a <clears throat> drawing between map and plan. The scale of this map is 1 to 1,000, and the landscape is the city of Zurich. It's a Rossi plan. Architecture student drew it in the uh, 1970s at ETH. Uh, the idea came from Saverio Muratori, but Aldo Rossi, who was teacher at ETH, bring it to the students. And it shows the city of Zurich, but not in a accustomed manner. It's a horizontal section. It's a floor plan of the city. And everything else is eliminated. You have no streets, no green, no names, nothing. It's like an X-ray image that shows only the naked architectonic skeleton of the city. This plan was a critic of the urban visions of at this time. And what seems at the first point a very neutral plan is a powerful man manifesto on urbanism. A very different kind of survey plan is this. We do it with our students. I show you a, a short series of students' plan. We did it with our first year students. The technique of this is very old, and you, I think you, everybody of you had done this. You, you uh, wrap the paper on the, over a, with the pencil over a coin, and then you make this frottage. The, Surrealists called this process frottage, and they left this technique because it left room for fantasy through its very suggestive nature. And that's exactly what we like, or what interests us as well. And we use this technique to survive a building site. This instrument shows nothing about the structure. It's absolutely made only to record the surfaces, the structure, the haptic, the, the haptic characteristic of a site, and in a way also its atmosphere. So I finally will start with a sample of construction drawings. I have sorted them in a totally uh, subjective uh, order. You could order them chronologically or uh, by the drawing technique, by the addressee, or even by the scale. But I try to order them in a subjective way, but with the idea to point out in every theme what can be the theme also of a construction drawing or maybe also to show you clearer or better what my interest is in this topic. So every, every theme will have three plans. I only show one plan from a house, and then I show one photo. The photo is not important. It's really the plan, but the, to make it a bit more easy to, to realize or to make a connection to the building. So we start with... My first plan, uh, plan I did when I started my office, and it's a very, that's a really neutral plan because it's a survey plan of an existing house. And as you can see, what I think is interesting that the plan has a, a convention. The, the sign arts coded. You can't make what you want. You have these codes where you follow. In this case, it's the colors of the directions to have an order in this uh, chaotic uh, jungle of ciphers or signs. That was the building who came up on this survey plan, a uh, renovation of an agricultural uh, home. <clears throat> the second plan, you know, maybe is from the Alison and Peter Smithson, the Apollon Pavilion. And this goes a step further. I think it's at the same time, it's an inventory, a survey plan, and at the same time, it's already a project drawing. And I think it's very characteristic for the Smithsons 
to it show how they integrate the new with the existing, the new with the old, and this uh, this uh, kind of making art architecture with a process with a constant changing. I think all these, even the, their phrase of as found, you know what is as found was their, uh, yeah, maybe their, I don't like to say philosophy, but their, their uh, topic or their uh, idea for a whole life. And I think all this idea you can, is really drawn in this plan. You know, the object, but the qualities of this architecture is already in this first survive plan. This is a, the third survive plan, and it's also survive plan and construction drawing in one. It's from the Viennese architects Hutmann and Wasch, and it's a plan of the parking area of the Alhambra in Spain. And <coughs> they did this. Did did this project as a watering facility. There are no buildings on the plain. Instead, there are tree trenches, parking areas, and drainage. All these, what you see, are drainage get gutters. And the scale of the plain is one to five, 5,000. And it's, despite of the very big scale, it's made with a very meticulous precision. I was once there on the site, and then I saw the, the architect, because there was no really survive plan existing, walking up and down with his, I don't know in English, double meter. Yeah, you know, this kind of measuring band with a sheet of paper in the, in the hand, step by step, step by step, and surveying every, every uh, <clears throat> every point in the exact elevation, because the, the, the most important thing on this uh, project is it, as it is a water, a water uh, drainage uh, project, is the slopes have to be absolutely perfect, so it's essential for the running of the water system. And what I like on this plan is that you don't see what it is, you neither see the landscape, nor the topography, you only see, uh, see ciphers. All these very small points are uh, hundred and hundred of ciphers. So <coughs> this construction drawing is not able to envision the future, future project. You have to really to read the plan, but the topography is in the numbers. So we were, are very near on another theme or another topic of construction plans, the codes, because every construction plan has to be an abstraction, has to be a transformation of a 3D idea to a sheet of paper, to a 2D, to a plan. And what about this abstraction? How do you transform this, this reality into a sort of coded science? It's always an act an act of translation or of, of uh, transforming something, and that's the theme of the next three plans. <clears throat> this, on the first side, or on the first impression, you was you can say or can think it's a it's an image. It's a, it's not a drawing. It's a painting, an abstract painting. But it, it's not. It's a misleading impression because if you really look, I don't know if you can see it, all these small points are numbers, and they deliver an exact, an exact planting schedule, since the building materials here are not normal materials, the building materials are flowers. And I think this plan too, the, the plan is from Roberto Burle Marx, the Brazilian landscape architect, and what's special here is it, it's, it is a painting, but at the same time it's a, a real construction drawing. And <clears throat> it, it is a very exact manual for the addressing the gardener how to have to plant. But at the same time it's an instrument for the architect to control the composition. And 
you will better understand when you see, see where it's, it is. It is a, a roof garden of the Ministry of Health and Education in Rio de Janeiro. And as you see here, the, all the offices have their windows out to this roof garden. So it shows really the, the attempt of uh, Boule Marx to make real an image. But <coughs> it also says something very uh, characteristic on Boule Marx because I, he, his aim was not to consider a single plan, but to use the plants in very big masses as a painter uses his colors. So I think his plan is not only a plan who says something about his garden, it says something, uh, something about he, all his life work. This plan <coughs> is also about coding and encoding. Here the num numbers two stands for colors. But this time the message <coughs> is not for shown or for the uh, garden, it's for the glazer. 72 numbers stand for 72 different colors spread over 11,263 11, squares. It's the plan, the building plan, or the building, uh, the construction drawing for, uh, here you see the numbers, Every, plan, every uh, quadrant has a small number. It's the construction plan for the window of the Dome of Colony of the, of the artist Richter. And <coughs> unlike in Burle Marx's plan, where the drawing is not meant, where the drawing was meant to control the composition, this plan is not meant to control the composition because the window is not the composition of the author, it is uh, composed by a random generator. So the drawing is really nothing else than a manual for the workman. And the color, colors stay for the different shapes on, of the pieces of glass. So the third plan of this series is a also a roof plan, and in a certain way it's uh, similar to the parking plan of the Alhambra of the Viennese architects, because it's the same aim to, to draw a landscape, a modulated uh, piece of architecture in a two-dimensional drawing. It's the construction drawing for the floor slab of the learning center at EPFL in Lausanne. It's the plan for the shuttering board. What you see here are the 1,400 moldings that were made for, to cast the, the concrete because it, it was very special that this slab was one piece only. You had to, to, pour, in the, to pour the concrete in uh, 48 hours, one piece, one deck, one ceiling. And also here the trap, these are the numbers of this, of the Casting area number is a whole one cast uh, a, form. a form, yes. So also here you can't see that uh, what you make with this plan, but it's a absolutely uh, a precise building manual. Here you see it better. <coughs> That's the final. You can even see it without numbers, but you can see the, the, the moldings in the concrete. So we come to the third theme, it's building manual, because the drawing is always a message. It's, it always has a, a, an addressee whom is, it is directed to somebody. And it's not made for the client, it's made for the professional. And therefore, it addresses different discipline. It's a bit like a musical notation that you write down something. It has to be translated and then it, had to, it has to be bring into reality. It 
This drawing is a message and also a manual. And now I have a I think I have a no, it's okay. It's a plan of Glen Market. The drawing is meant, I think, with this own plan you can make the whole house. Nothing is missing, even the construction specifications, which you normally put on another piece of shape in a book, is really uh, drawn direct on the plan. With this you can build a, 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 the entire house, but I think it shows something also very characteristic for this architect, because, you know, uh, Glen Market, this house stands really in the jungle, in the wasteland where you don't have professionals, you only have some workers all around there which do everything from the, the metallic construction to the, to the uh, carpenter's uh, work. And I think this plan is typical for such a, such a aim that you have all gather all discipline or in one plane and it has to be possible to read for everybody that's the building then we come to Carlos Scarpa also here the colors indicate stone not colors really but stone qualities and also this plan is a, a real instruction for the mason. And I think also this plan is very characteristic of, the, of this architect. Because in Carlos Carpa drawings, the idea of the whole building is every time visible in every detail. And in his case, the drawing, the construction drawing, who goes to the building site, does not emerge on the end of the sequence. Scarpa sketches are construction drawings. As much as his uh, construction drawings are even sketches. And <clears throat> I quote <clears throat> a phrase he said, <clears throat> so I quote Scarpa, if I want to see things, I do not trust anything else. I put them in front of me here on paper to be able to see them. I want to see, and for this I draw. I can see an image only when I draw it. So remember what I said about Gottfried Boehm, who said, I think with my hands in modeling. <clears throat> so here, really, the construction drawing and the concept sketch are the same. And we know that Scarpa continued to alt alter his drawings and to redraw them, even on the building site. I have a very old friend who worked with Scarpa personally. And he told me a very nice anecdote. I said when he went to the building site in the morning and Scarpa came, the, the muratoris, the workers, always the, the first question was, che cambiamo oggi? What means, uh, what do we alter today? What do we make new today? And maybe you know that he all even visits the building site at night with a pocket lamp to really to only focus on the small details. And I think all this is visible in, the, in this uh, construction drawing. And there is something I like very much. I think it's very nice to see, I don't know, accidenti or here even telefonare, <laughs> what means I have not to, please don't forget, he says to himself to to make a phone. So you see that really a, a construction drawing is at the same time a very, very practical and very useful thing. <clears throat> Another drawing from Jean Prouvé. I think this now is a real building manual because it showed the building component in all the sites, all different uh, Taxonometric drawing, 3D, 2D plan section, and it shows not only 
the building as a section or so, it all also show how it's put together. And also, there is something for me very typical or characteristic for Prouvé. You see he has very small space. The, the plan is full of details. Nothing is let white. And even how he arranged his, these pieces on the paper, I think it, it shows a very something what was the main aim of Prouvé or one of the main aims that was economy. So you can even read this uh, on his very uh, pragmatic plan. I will make a short abbreviation to our first, uh, the plans our students do. It's the first plan they do when they come on, the, on their, their really first uh, drawing. And they are really, they have to build something and then they do a, a manual. Because it leads me to the, the to another topic, which is the building process. I think you have in the plan, you have the possibility to also manage the time. It's not only how to how a building has to look like. You can put in the the theme of time, the fourth dimension, because you have to note step by step how you do a work. So this plan from an old uh, Swiss architect, Blunschli, it doesn't show nothing of the building itself, but only the building process. He tells the bricklayer how to put every single row of brick. And I think only a drawing can do this so efficient. And even if it's uh, analog or digital, what is the theme of this, uh, of this, uh, all this, uh, I will show you now a really different plan. It's, it's in a form, it's the same as you saw before from Blunchley, this bricklayer plan, but it's a, a real digital plan because even the bricklayer is not the human person, it, the bricklayer is also a digital person, as we could say, it's a robot. And so how does a, or what does a drawing look like when the bricklayer has no eyes and no ears? The drawing has, must, does not have to show how the building has to look like because the robot has no sense of proportion. And, but you have to make every repetition has to be programmed and every single row of stones has to be indicated and everything has to be in a real, nearly unhuman precision, uh, precision because there is no human control of the, or no control of the human eye. So this plan has no image, no plan, no section. It is really replaced uh, by the fourth dimension, by time, it's like a, a, a musical notation. A very different uh, kind of plan is this, uh, but also here the construction drawing make not visible the building. It's, it's uh, special because it shows something which is removed at the end. It's the uh, casting plan, uh, the plan for the casting pieces. And you, you will only see the marks, the leaves on the building, but not the, the really the pieces are are not visible, but you, sh you can easily see the, the, really the principle of a casting and the, the formless the, or maybe the, the difference between the tectonic uh, principle of a casting and the very untectonical quality of the concrete, of the pouring. And what is interesting, it's not the section of the plan, it's like uh, unwinding all of all the facades. So we move to the next chapter, which is perspective, uh, 
spatial perspec uh, perception because <clears throat> I think models show architecture in 3D, that's obvious. Renderings pretend to do the same, but I think only the drawing is able to show really the different or even the very contradictory perspectives at the same time. So this plan is a facade plan who shows the complex geometry of the Monte Rosa Hütte by Andrea de Platzis. And I think only with, a, with such a drawing you can really comp uh, also this, all, only this drawing enables to control the complete succession of the facade, the complete su succession. There you, maybe you see what I mean. You can't pick it up with a facade plan in a normal, normal way. This drawing contains every detail of construction. At the same time, it contains the quality of space. Even you can see the user already. But also here, I think it's a very characteristic uh, pl uh, plan or drawing of this, uh, of Atelier Bauau, because I think their characteristic maybe could uh, be, say in a short phrase that they make uh, interacting between spatial, between spatial concept and construction. And th that's just what you see here on this construction drawing. The last of these three plans is from Francesco Borromini. You know, everybody knows the Santivo alla Sapienza in Rome. What I think is interesting here that you, what he makes, you can even not ma make with the most perfect 3D image because a 3D image can only show what is a one space, but not, or one uh, vision. But what he, does here, he make an elevation, he make a section, he made a ground plan, and he put all together in one single drawing. So you can see with one glance, you can connect all these three different drawings and grasp the entire building. So the real final image is composed in the head of the spectator. So we got to, <coughs> we come to a very important theme, important in every sense in architecture, scale, numbers, measure, proportions. And that's clear that only the drawing can really, uh, only plans have a real scale, models too, but it's clear that the plan is the, the media or the mean to transmit real measures. The drawing you see here is uh, from Peter Zumthor. It's the bell tower of San Benedic. And I think one can see that it was drawn by a, for a former furniture maker, as Peter Zumthor was. And f on the first side, it shows how the tower is constructed. But also here, I think there is a very uh, characteristic point of this architect. If I ask you, what do you need to put a, a clock? It's a clock tower. What do you need to put a clock in the height of, of this tower? It's that the most simple, most essential construction is a ladder. And no, uh, naturally, this ladder has more uh, association. It reminds of the Jacob's ladder, you know, of the Bible. And at the same time, it's, uh, the letter follows a harmonious numerical scale. Always the half of one section is subtracted to the next. And the higher the tower, the shorter are the distance between the staves of the letter. And to me, it reminds me a bit of the Scala Regia in, in Vaticano, which uses the same kind of... Uh, manipulating the perspective. 
Here you see the reality. It's really like, built like a ladder. Here a plan of our, uh, uh, not my office, but of my chair at ETH. I have maybe to extend a bit. I, I thought I would show you only this small plan, but I, yesterday I was with Jürgen and we spoke about uh, the question of analog and digital. And what is here interesting, that we were searching, the, the beginning of this project was searching for very old uh, construction principles we find a principle which is functioning with very small pieces of wood. The first uh, pictures we could find were, were uh, made from by uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and then in nearly every uh, secolum you, you we re or we found another example from Philippe de Lorme or other uh, architect of the Renaissance and even of uh, Baroque. And <clears throat> we, we looked if this kind of construction, because it's very intelligent, you can overspan very big spans with very small piece of, of wood, what is very interesting for the hardwood, because in the hardwood, as you know, it's not very good for construction because it's too, it's not, uh, it's too uh, crooked. And so we made this, uh, we reinvented uh, in a kind, uh, this kind of construction pr principle, reciprocal framework. And now we saw that it has really, I think it has really a future because we have now this means of the digital machines. And what you saw before was a plan to build exactly this pavilion. It's like the plan for the robot, it's only uh, ciphers. And uh, the four things which are on the plan are the slats, the, the point of the knot, the, the length of the, of the pieces, and the uh, the point where they have their crucial their knots. So this plan is not meant for a worker, but it goes direct to the, the to the I don't know in German the, uh, in English the Abbund machine, trimming maybe, the trimming machine. Abbund machine trimming machine, the, the machine who cuts and forms the pieces. Another very special plan is this, it's from Gottfried Semper, it's the ETH. What I like on this plan is that the scale of this drawing is one to one. So the plan is just as the, the building one to one. And what is nice on this plan, maybe you can see it here, there are very small holes. Maybe here you can see better. You know, these are all small holes to pin a, a, a needle on. So this, this construction plan is not only a plan, it's even a, a real construction uh, instrument. It's to point the sketch of the sgraffito of the ETH uh, main building. So you can see that the construction plan can even be a real one-to-one -one scale instrument. Uh, last short excursion in, in our studio. I think scale is one of the most important seems in architecture in any case, and I think you can only really grasp it if you do it by hand, one-to-one. -one. So we make plans, really one-to-one -one plans, three to two meters uh, high, enormous plan. It's always a very uh, logic, uh, logistic uh, adventure, and then the students has to, I think it's one thing is that you really uh, 
learn to have a feeling about all this dimension. But at the same time, I think uh, any scale, even if, if the, the building is a big, huge thing, that scale is always related on the, or the, the reference is always the human body. So we make this plan to interact one-to-one. -one. So I will go back to uh, another uh, topic. <clears throat> In these plans, the question is how to draw uh, or how to show a material. How a drawing in pencil or digital drawing can really show the essence of the materiality, texture, con consistency, aura, structure, mass, quality, all these questions. And I will show you a plan of uh, John Caminada. And I think here you can really see that the very sharp point in pencil seems to be the perfect tool to draw a wood construction. This house is made in massive timber construction technique. And I think John Caminada communicates more than just a construction technique because he showed a seamless series of dimensions of the construction components. And even what is very important in such a type of uh, wood construction, it even shows the, the tolerance range. All this is already incorporated in the scale and in the measures. And I think, too, it's a pleasure for the timber carpenter and even for us, for our sense of harmony and proportion. And this, this drawing tells something further that tradition is not kept alive through preservation, but rather through renewal. Another example for the question of materiality. This small church, Klippan, in, in, in Klippan in Sweden, drawn by Sigurd Leverens. And I think if you look at this plan, the bricklayer will make sure not to lay one single brick in the wrong place. The architect has predetermined every single stone Every joint, the entire building, is the sum of the tiniest part. It's interesting to look as he, as he draws the borders, where he has to point really every single, where it begins to be difficult. And so he has to point out every single brick. And in the middle, then, when it goes uh, regular, he can leave a bit. But I think the whole aura of the building material is in this plan is really visible and tangible. And even the for leverance, very typical, you know, this very wide mortar joint, yes, very wide joints. They are uh, in this plan, they are really present in the blurred pencil of the, the blurred pencil traces. And I think in this plan, one can almost physically smell the brick. And not only this, the drawing demonstrates the brick's specific qualities and also the logic of the small module of out which you can build an entire house or even an entire town. And not at least, the plan is also beautiful. Another plan, this is a completely different drawing. It is not drawn by an architect, but by an engineer. It's made by Sigur Mitsutani, that was the engineer of Paolo Mendes da Rocha. And it's the roof slab of an apartment block in Sao Paulo. But just as, as the wall plan by Leverance, this plan is likewise reduced to a specific topic. It shows the structure and one single building procedure the load-bearing concrete framework. This plan has no, uh, or it's a building instruction without any concession to please. It only addresses the skilled worker. But at the same time, I think it really illustrates the human intelligence that uh, is in this work or hidden in the building.
But what if we don't look at the material, if we look at the building component? It's a very different uh, theme for a construction plan. It's the potential to gather all aspects of a building component in one and only drawing, because more than just a plan or a section, we, you can make a drawing which controls every aspect of a building component. And for sure, then he has to address different discipline, every professional who is involved in this building process. This is an air duct of our office. And it is the typical element you would like to hide, you try to hide. But in this case, it was not possible because the very tight budget didn't allow. So we had, uh, we had to make a virtue out of the necessity. And the air duct is at the same time a supporter of a kind of candlestick. It carries the lights. And this plan shows the object, the montage, and at the same time, it addresses all the different disciplines who are involved, as you can see here, or when it was finally up, put up in the, in the room. A very different component stands here. Here, the component stands for the whole idea of the building. I think one could say this. The building material here seems more to be air than to be stone. But because the gabions, what you see here, only uh, bear themselves, I think one could say the, the real or the uh, kind of building material here is light. The idea of the stone-filled gabions is a high form of handiwork. If I say this, I don't mean this dismissively, at the contrary. I think it's also very characteristic for these architects, Herzog de Meron, that they use an existing tool, this uh, steel wire basket, but they utilize it in a very unfamiliar or, let's say, incorrect context. It's a kind of subversion. And for me, it's very typical for this office work that they work it, their working method range exactly on these borderlines. And the interesting thing in this case is that many of these so-called solutions are not solutions in a traditional sense. They are not logical conclusions to a clearly stated question. Instead, they are more a kind of random discoveries on a journey into unknown territories. So here, a uh, last plan of uh, building component. What do you think why this construction drawing, for me it looks like a page of a school book about natural history. And I think that makes sense if you know uh, Utzen's way of thinking. Utzen has a, a very different notion of structure. For Utzen, structure is a quality of nature. And to construct for him means to understand the rules of nature. And I think all this world of Hudson's uh, understanding of, of structure of nature is uh, visible in this simple plan of a detail of the Hudson's opera house. Also here the de detail is the overall of the project. If we go further to the last chapter, we come to structure. And what you saw in Utzon's plan, that the Utzon's, Utzon does not only show the visible structure, but also the hidden rules of the order. And one could ask, how about, but, or what about the potential of the construction drawing to show the invisible parts of a building? Only the construction drawing can show the hidden skeleton of a built body or even how the organs inside function. So the drawing does not only show the building, it shows how the building works. I will quote the short phrase of Pierluigi Nervi. He said, 
the shape, the pattern of the steel, the reinforcement should always have an aesthetic quality and give the impression of a nervous system that make the dead mass of concrete alive. I think his plan is a perfect proof of this sentence because what you can see here is not only the hidden skeleton of the reinforcement, you can even see the three different layers of the reinforcement separate visible. So it really shows not only how it's made, but also how this body uh, functions. So the second last plan is, uh, I will quote once more, the shape, the pattern of the steel, the reinforcement should always have an aesthetic quality. I think it's a very nice quote of Nervi because it says that something that no one will see never is, has to have a, an aesthetical quality. And I think what Nervi demands the, to this aesthetic quality is exactly what shows the drawing by the Indian engineer Mahindra Raj. It's like an X-ray image. It shows the nerves, the knot of the space frame, which is very uh, uncommon, that, but it's made in, uh, in situ concrete. The building seems, and it was all also initially planned as a prefabricated construction, but finally they had to build it in situ concrete as a trib tribute to the technical possibility then in India. And I think all this long story of this building is still visible in this plan. Here you see the knot. And the so-called beauty of the hidden structure. And finally the building. So I come to my last example, and this shows something totally different. It's a building that undermines all the classifications we have made so far. And try to imagine for a, uh, for a moment a building made of a transitory building material, not out of timber, not out of of concrete, but only of water and air. The drawing and the project, i show you later, the drawing and the project can hardly be recognized as belonging together. The construction drawing merely shows the supporting framework and the kind of uh, climate machine. So my last image is the re realization of this construction plan. It's a, a, a blur. And the mantle, however, it's an illusion. It's real fleetingness. It's just water and air. But behind this very transitory image, a kind of architectural dream to build something without of building material, behind this stands poor technology. And so I think it's, it's a good image or a good example to, uh, to say once more or to uh, summarize what I tried to show with the construction drawing. It's not to make, I think the importance is not to, to divide between technical drawings and aesthetic or artistic drawings, not be, uh, divide these uh, two different uh, areas. I think it's one and the same. And I think the construction drawings reveal a lot about your thoughts, about your projects, and even about your person. And so I think uh, behind this, for me, stands also the conviction that construction and technique is not only to solve your problems, it is a fundamental quality of architecture. And so finally, I would like to quote a uh, short phrase of the French, uh, French author 
Stefan Mallarmé, he says, poems are not made out of feelings, they are made out of words. And I think this is also true in architecture. Thank you. Do we have a discussion or? I would like. <laughs> Do you have remarks or something that was not? We usually have a microphone to speak it somewhere. Mm -hmm. I have it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. It's a, it's a wonderful lecture. Uh, I think it's maybe the most didactive lecture I've ever heard. The most? The most um, didactive. Yeah, I thought it's for a student pub public. Yes, and <laughs> maybe I not like for the old uh, f uh, hares and foxes. But, but I, th I think you are wrong there, because uh, for me uh, it was um, as didactive. And I have been uh, in the business of architecture for, wh for a while. No, so. Hmm. Uh, but I, I can't I, understand. No, I, I'm saying um, it was. Yeah, I think also for us, all of us, it was very didactive. I think. I don't think you you need to be a, um, a student in the beginning. Yeah, uh, to <laughs> Really, I, I really mean that. And I would like to say that oh, I only reg regret that um, the first year students are not uh, present because they're in Italy. I think. So that's really makes me very sorry. But it has been filmed, so um, it will be possible for them. And I think the teachers responsible for them should um, insist that they see this film. Uh, but I would like to ask you, because I know that um, um, the Australian... Um, Glenn Glen Market. Glenn Market, yeah. yeah. He, he has very um, clear meanings about his process of drawing the building. And he... <coughs> He, he does every every uh, drawing by hand, always, and uh, that's every drawing. And and he, I think he was asked, and he says that he thinks that it makes simply because it makes good architecture. W what what would be your comments on that? Yeah, I think that's the essential. That's what I try to say. I think also for the old architect, I have many friends, my colleagues, famous architects, and they like to say, oh, uh, I have. I don't draw anymore. I have more important uh, aufgaben, and, uh, and I think they are totally wrong because I'm absolutely convinced that to get really at the point, you all you can. Oh, it's our mean. It's like uh, it's it's the language you. It's if you read, uh, if you write, you need the language, the writing, to get to the point, to get to the to think with. And so I think the drawing is a uh, is the mean you yeah for me it's a wonderful uh, example that Merkert he does all I heard that he has no one or two students but no architect in his office I heard this I don't know if it's true and he still makes every drawing him by himself and you can see it's, it's such a perfect uh, a perfect construction you you can only uh, uh, arrive with such a uh, process of working you know him no. yeah but i know his work I mean, yeah but what would be your, then your uh, what would be your um, attitude to, to the, the new tools that we have i mean obviously computers can make drawings as well i mean you, you press a button on your printer and it comes out the drawing but the process of of the drawing, I mean, he, he has, uh, he, he, uh, he has, um, as I also think that it has something to do with the, you know, the balance of the, the hand and the heart and the body, because when you draw, 
I mean, when you draw, uh, when when I draw with my May line, which I love, it's mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite things in the world. It's my May line, and <laughs> uh, and some I think some Americans made that, and and they they um, uh, it, it's it's a wonderful feeling, and, and it has to um, it has to do with the, the movement and the, the distance between one point and the other, uh, which is something that is is not present when you work with computers, mm -hmm. at least not in the same way. Uh, but wh what do you think, I mean, uh, all, I, I guess also in Switzerland, everyone's working with computers in offices at the moment. Yeah, and I think you, you have to use both. For me, it's, it's not to play the one against the other, that make no sense. The, 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 this uh, reciprocal framework, for example, you can't make it. It's a plan you only can make by computer, and I think that makes sense. But I think uh, what for me difficult, if I, I draw with computer, is that you have no, you are totally absorbed to pit, put uh, the length in, and so you have no time to be, yeah, go a bit around with your. <laughs> So that is a difficulty. It don't let you the time to, you know, to move like this, and you have to calculate every uh, drawing by hand. You can get nearer and nearer to the to the scale, to the to the proportions, to the me measures, and the drawing with a with the computer, you have put the measures in. With a, you can't draw without knowing what you do, but I think it makes no sense to, to say that this is better or this. It's totally different. And what is interesting, if you look at persons or architects who make nice hand planes, they make also the nicest uh, computer drawings, because I think finally the, the feeling for, this, for all this, the graphics and so, it's the same. Is this an answer? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, first, um, thank you for very nice uh, and good messages and examples. Uh, and it may be also curious, a little related to, uh, I think Jürgen said that you work both as a professor and you work in practice. And uh, I'm a little curious about the Swiss situation regarding, let's say, being in practice and uh, how is the demand from clients and other partners in the in the construction business regarding architects going and working on a very detailed level, mm -hmm. like you have shown uh, very good examples, uh, because we see that the role has changed. So uh, in many, many projects, uh, you are not asked to do all the detailing. Mm -hmm. they, I know. And uh, that's from one part. And, uh, and the other part is that in a number of situations, you really have to work with the engineers and with production knowledge uh, how do you let's say uh, how is that situation uh, uh, in switzerland in switzerland yeah. and uh, how can you develop this these messages in that kind of setting i think we are a bit always a bit late <laughs> i think we are on the same way as every other country that it's more and more the, the architects become all, only a designer, and I think it's wrong, but it's like this, we can't change it so easily. But we, we still have this tradition of making all the details, and it, it functions, but I think not, not so... Uh, you can just uh, know that there's, there's the same way of uh, giving it away, and the construction, and all these... Uh, sh uh, how do I call this plague? It's a real plague of all these other uh, professionals who put the hands on our on our uh, discipline. But for me, the question is: What do you what do you uh, uh, teach at school? Make it sense to teach something what you what seem to be uh, vanishing to say we we hold against or do we follow the time and it's not so easy to, to answer. I think one should hold against because it's interesting that these new uh, uh, construction teams, uh, the reciprocal framework or something like this, gets a new, uh, or it, it, 
it demands newly a very high uh, understanding of detailing, and so I think it's not really the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I loved your le uh, your lecture, um, and also lo love your title. I mean, uh, that these construction drawings or architectural drawings are love letters. Um, just to comment on the question up right now, because uh, seeing drawing not necessarily only a way of presenting a product, but a, a way of thinking then I think uh, we will keep, uh, keep our tradition in teaching the hand, the eye and the body to, 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 to sort of train that way of thinking. But uh, to the love letter aspect, because when you are in a professional uh, project, you're giving away the drawing. Or nowadays you give away the model. Not, not anything on paper, you, you, you send it by email or a project hotel or something. Um, one really important characteristic of, of, of the beautiful hand drawings here are a sense of order, a sense of logic, and also so, some kind of feeling. You, you, you get the identity of the architect or the work at hand that somehow um, sort of is being uh, communicated to to the receiver of the drawing so then you you can maintain some kind of love or respect for the project in the builder that receives the drawing how how can you put that kind of sense of love and respect and uh, attention into a digital model <laughs> difficult I think in a certain way you can make the same because I am absolutely sure if you look at the digital plan you see the same, uh, you know, the Sorgfalt, uh, what is Sorgfalt? Uh, no, Sorgfältig, Sorgfalt. The dedic precision, precision dedication, dedication, what you put in. I think it's not really the, the question of the instrument, but for sure this handwriting or this, uh, it's like a Unterschrift. Signature? Signature, it's, it's mm. not the same, obviously, but I, I really, I can't say, I don't know. <laughs> Therefore, I think it's, it's useful to use both. And the plan to goes to the to the professional. Why make it by hand? But in the process, I think it's it's a good option to switch. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I agree with what you say. I I I'm really happy that you uh, have shown us uh, so many interesting and different ways of using plans. And the plans show often, besides uh, that they are a tool to define a building, they have its own character or an own beauty shown in this abstraction. And I think that's, that's very, uh, very fascinating. And to the students, I think it's important that we also dare to write and put numbers and measures. It's mm -hmm. not destroying the plans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. <laughs> but it has an old, uh, yeah, it's really poetic to, to, to see such a, draw, uh, such a construction plan is something wonderful. And uh, because I, I know in, in many offices, young architects, they come and they draw and do nice drawings, but they don't dare to, to use uh, fonts bigger than Six <laughs> points. So, so, do not be afraid of putting a lot of information. It can be beautiful. Um, something that I would like to ask you is a bit at the ETH nowadays. How much hand drawings are taught? 
how much do the students uh, do hand drawings? Is it only in first year or even uh, later? Yeah, it's very personal. I do it, and I do it in the first semester, and then we switch to, to digital plans. And this year, the first year, I tried to. We had to. We made a, a, a structures, and for structure, I think handmade is good. So we we have a whole year. Uh, analog plans and the students they do it from the first day and they have a really a great ability they do fantastic plans you don't believe it how they can draw f uh, very easily by hand but I think it's for me it's clear I'm in the first year if I would teach in the in the master course I I wouldn't make this for me it's to to grasp what is uh, measure what is scale what is all this important question I think it's uh, you can only grasp this by or uh, uh, go there by hand but then I would I would follow with digital plans but there are some professor for example Peter Merkley in his off in his uh, studio teacher everybody has to draw by hand but it's an exception normally it's it's computer plan but maybe also I think it, it's it's a bit a lack not to teach also how to draw with computer the same qualities or the same. It's not just a machine, it's also a, an instrument that you have to deal with and get a feeling for. And Something that I am interested in is a bit um, the the thing that we produce with different tools, do we have different results? Because you said, yeah, Glenn Merkert, this is only, this quality is only possible by hand drawings. I would say question mark if this is really <laughs> true, because we, we know there are other good results yeah, you're right. done you're right. by digital tools. But do the new tools offer us more. But I wouldn't, mm. then you have misunderstand me. I think it's not, the, for me, the market is not the question that he drew by hand. It's that he himself drew the plans. I wanted to say that the quality of his architecture is that he's controlling every single point. And he can cook, in my eyes, he could do it also maybe with this kind of plan. You can't exactly draw with, with a with a digital mean. But your last question was? Yeah, if we, if we get another result when we use another tool, can we, can we get more than in the past? You have a lot of examples that are hand-drawn because it's somehow looking back to the history, but now we have new tools what can we expect of that? Yeah, I think it's a bit, it's not new, but it's still, if you see over long periods, the digital uh, drawing is a, is a new mean, and I think it's not, it has a long <laughs> uh, way forward. I think it's, we are beginners, or we, maybe we, we haven't yet uh, took out all the, the potential that it has. But I think the real potential is really to make plants who would go direct to the like these robot plants. For me, it's also something interesting, which only allows uh, uh, digital plans. But what you say, I'm convicted that uh, the means has an impact on the, on the result. Uh, but I can't say. <laughs> If I see a building, I can't say this is <laughs> drawn by hand or by, by, it's not so clear. There, back. Me, me actually, the sound guy, uh, actually. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm what you would call a common man. I worked as a carpenter for 10 years before starting working in town. And I think uh, drawings are can become quite a headache for us on the work site. Okay. Uh, quite a headache, the drawings. 
Uh, but I like the idea of uh, drawing things in scale, which is sh showed us. Uh, but actually, what's the most headache is construction engineers when they draw, because they draw they don't see spaces. They don't. They just draw buildings, and that's it. Often. And uh, do you think there's something in there that w you were talking about earlier uh, that the architects are doing less and less detailed work on site, stuff like that? Uh, I think that's a bad thing because I see, you know, a student, uh, students and uh, yeah, houses, things like that today, they become more and more standard, mass produced, less spaces, less details. Are are we losing something in the process? I, yeah, I don't know. I don't like to be so pessimistic, but I, I think yes, we lose something. And uh, the the result we don't see yet. It's coming on, but we have not really. We can't judge it really because it's uh, it's the beginning of, of a uh, losing control for the architect, which I'm totally sure it has an impact on the buildings. But I can't say really look there or, but I think one can feel it if you have a control over everything. And that's, uh, I think really architecture should not be uh, uh, reduced to design. It's much more than design. You said something? But I didn't understand what you said with headache. Kopfweh, Yeah, Kopfschmerzen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because uh, often when we got drawings, it was a constructional engineer, and you had a hallway, for instance, and it was one meter wide, and you had doors on each side of the hallway, and he hadn't, he wasn't going on site and seeing all the details. He hadn't been to many buildings. He was just finished in school, engineering school, and he went on to drawing. So he wasn't that conscious on details. Yeah, so but actually, yeah. in, my, in the company that I work, we had to bring the structural engineers out on the work site to show them you can't draw things like this because people are going to live here and there's no space for them to live in because there's a lot of hallways, <laughs> small rooms, <laughs> crooks and nannies. But and he says, yeah, but it's perfect for IKEA and uh, <laughs> the, the modern world. <laughs> so like, <laughs> so yeah, but so I, I think yeah. um, I, I liked at my company, I liked an architect to, to but supervise. But what you what you refer is also, uh, I think we have to. Uh, for me, it's very interesting. For example, how Zumthor uh, works and uh, Gary works. Gary is an American. Frank Gary. He works with this. Uh, like ready-made, like if he goes to a, I think he's a very exact, very precise architect, but he works with a, for me it's like if you go in and do it yourself and you pick the things because it's a tradition. And Zumthor on the other side, meticulous, every coin has to be self-made. And so I think it's both, both uh, ways are, equally interesting for me, not not some door or the one is better than the other or more interesting, but maybe this kind of uh, invent an architecture that, that is not so demanding, this meticulous uh, detailing is what we use now or what we have to looking for. For example, uh, Lacaton Vassal, they are very precise, but they build in a kind that is a bit more not so... Uh, uh, fable or how can I, a bit more ro robust, we say in Germany, robust. It's, it's not so depending on this detailing and I think that's maybe also we, we have to switch a bit uh, how to think a building. If you make, if you don't work well out the Sumtor building, it's a disaster. And with the Gary building you can give it to the I, a bit over. I think it's not like this, but you can give it and the worker makes it and it doesn't go wrong. You know what I mean? I exaggerate, but I think it's a bit also this question you, you are referring to, no? 
I would like to add something about the scale. I, I think when you say one meter, this is for me a typical computer yeah. age problem. Huh? You <laughs> zoom in, you zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, you have no relation. And if I ask the students, how wide is this space? Oh, um, mm, I have to measure. So they do not know how, if, if it was 20 meters or five meters. It's, 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 um, you lose a bit uh, relation to scale when you draw on the computer. That's the weak point, I yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the weak point. The uh, just uh, one comment. Um, and uh, I really think you have to both, uh, you have to work with both doing by hand to understand it and to develop the old techniques. But at the same time, it, I think it's really important for students and for the profession to develop knowledge and capacity and to develop the use of these modern tools. Uh, because they give, they sh it's like a tool and it should really be integrated in your fingers also. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. That's also something that puts the architect in the future as an important part in the process. If you don't go work with that, uh, I think we will always be looking back on what we did and we will be forced by others. So it's, I, I think really, and I hope you again, that we will have good examples of using really sophisticated good tools in, in, because I think it's important for the profession and for the studies. Yeah, I agree totally. And you Absolutely. have direct control again about yep. direct control on the manufacturing. Yeah, I will thank you for a very nice lecture. I think that um, for me, um, I'm mainly working as an artist, but uh, uh, I find that drawing, to draw something is a way of thinking. So actually the drawing, even either it's digital or if it's drawn by pencil, it's, uh, it tells about the kind of presence and a kind of caretaking about details and how to, that yeah, must yeah, <laughs> to walk around in the, to, to in a way think the paint, think the building. And um, I was thinking about the Aboriginal um, way of making the map. They have this singing, they are singing the map. They are walking in and by a song they are actually finding the way. So this is a way of being present in the drawing or present in what you are doing. I think that's the main thing. And it could be digital, it could be by pencil. Absolutely agree. <laughs> I have nothing to say that uh, it's clear. Uh, I would just like to um, say again that I enjoyed your lecture very, very much. And I would also, um, I would like to remind everyone here about uh, the, um, the way you have constructed the lecture, because it's a construction that is very, very clear and very, very, as I said, didactic and um, very powerful in, in you communicating something to us. So I think it's... Um, it's a construction. I once asked Sverfen about um, his relation to the word construction, and he talked about um, oh, oh. Sverfen, the, yes, yes, the the, the Pritzker yeah. winning uh, Norwegian architect, and he he talked about um, construction. He talked about uh, some um, um, stories by uh, uh, Henrik Ibsen. Uh, you know the um, the playwright and and the, the the clear and very very um, strong construction that he uses building up uh, these stories. That was one example that he he talked about when about the word construction. But I I really I think that the the way you have constructed this lecture is is very very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just have a quick question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to pull it any much further. I just want to comment, uh, because we talk a lot about producing models and drawings on the computer and by hand. And 
I don't think there's much debate about how the architects write, because writing is also mm -hmm. thinking, and mm -hmm. I think that's also a really important tool to communicate um, the ideas behind a design, and uh, maybe a forgotten art. I was wondering what you thought about that. Did you know what uh, Oscar Niemeyer made when he, he told once, if he, if he come on an end, he don't know how to go on with a project, and he puts every drawing away, he writes text, and then he goes further. And if he don't, is able to write a very short text about the building, then he begins new. I think it's, it's also a media for us, but it's not enough. We don't <laughs> only write our words, logical. But behind is the same question, does with the media you sharpen your, if it's drawing or modeling or writing or whatever, you sharp your ideas with, with doing. But you're right, and it's, I think uh, in the schools maybe it it's makes sense to also strengthen the, the, the ability of writing or the, yeah, I don't know what you think. I think it was interesting what you told me yesterday evening about uh, the book and trying to have other authors and that the strong, <laughs> the people, the architects who are really strong in doing wonderful drawings, they can't write. Yeah, <laughs> there are some, Moneo, Raphael Moneo for me is the big uh, exception he do. He does fantastic writings. But normally, really, it's not so. I think maybe it's like a, a talent, and then it's yeah. good. They made their choice about language. Huh? They made their choice about language. They choose the drawing. Yeah, yeah, and we are not... Normally, we are not the most talented writers, but I think what you said is not to write the literature, but to, to sharpen the, the idea, no? But it's true, it's difficult to find writing architects. Okay, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you again thank you. with a big thank applause. You.